Good morning, everyone. We are now in our last chapter in our study in the book of Jonah, and we are in chapter four. But before we get into chapter four, it is important by way of review uh, that if you have missed last week's class, that you should actually review the class video. But for our purpose this morning, I would like to draw your attention to a few things before we begin chapter four. When we first started in chapter three, I think we had spent some time talking about the prophecy that Jonah was to speak to the people in Nineveh, that he is supposed to cry out loud and speak about 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And this is important because this word overthrow right here has a dual meaning to throw over or turn over. And this has a dual meaning, one being a positive and one being a negative. And so the negative would be the city would be destroyed, overturned, right? So the city is destroyed. That's one way of looking at it. The second way of looking at it, but from a positive side into this Hebrew word, is that God's decision to destroy Nineveh is overturned. And that is the good side of it in the sense that the city would not be destroyed. So that would be uh, a better way of looking at this word overthrow to be to turn over. So in 40 days, Nineveh will be thrown over. When the people heard all this, they did all kinds of rituals, which in their mind, remember, they are not Israelites. They do not have the Torah. Uh, they did what was culturally and um, in their society, uh, a, a form of ritualistic repentance. So they had a fast. They put on sackcloth. So all of these are, I guess, uh, depictions or descriptions of actions that they thought that would appease God. And then uh, the king would lay aside his robe, cover himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes. But more importantly, he continued to say, let no man or bees, herd or flock, all must fast. Don't eat, don't drink water. And covered with sackcloth. And cry mightily to God. But the important thing I wanted to point out to you is the next phrase. That is what God is actually looking at. He says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. By way of review, I think we ought to remember evil is in the eyes, is viewed from the eyes of the beholder. And the beholder in this case is God. And so how does God view them being evil? That would be the violence or Hamas that is in his hands. Basically, we're talking about uh, dishonest, dishonest games. That is, that they are possessing, whether by way of uh, violence, unfair treatment, robbing, cheating, whatever that may be, that they are to turn, they are to repent. That is what God was looking for. Not the sackcloth, fasting, and all the feeling of remorse, but without doing the repayment or reconstitution uh, and, and to give back what they have done evil, 
then God would not view it favorably. So what's in the evil in the eyes of God needs to be reversed by repentance. And so this is what Hamas literally tells us. That's what they have done. Now, I want to point out to us as we enter into chapter 4 that that is also what Israel is doing. And that was what Jonah was, was warning Israel that they are to stop all this Hamas. Stop the violence, injustice. Do not treat people unfairly. Do not rob them. Do not twist the law. Do not hurt them. Do not cheat them. Do not rob them. And the same thing is being done in Nineveh. So it doesn't matter whether you have the temple or you don't have the temple. People, when they are in power, when they have money, they get stronger. There is a tendency for those in the top end of the society uh, to consider themselves as little lords or little kings and they could do anything they want and in the eyes of God that is injustice and must be rectified. Now in verse 10 we also see how God saw their work. So it's not so much that no they thought about returning uh, but they didn't. It is really that God saw what they did, that they turned from their evil way, which means that it is something very visible, that those who have conducted dishonest games in some form or other had returned their loot, their games that is they are possessing now. And God saw what they had done. Now, we didn't know or we're not told that Every single one had repented. We are just told that, yes, they, they actually repented. How many repented? We don't know. Did every single individual who did wrong repent? We don't know. But we do know that it actually pleased God because when he saw that, he relented from the disaster he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So it means that his decision was overturned. So the prophecy actually held true by nothing happening. That God says, okay, since you have repented, I will not destroy or overturn Nineveh. Again, I highlight to us that we are not aware if 100% of every a violent and dishonest and evil individual repented. But I suppose enough of them that God says, to be fair, he will not destroy the city. Now, it gives us a context getting into chapter 4. In chapter 4, it says here, and then. Now, we need to also be aware that the 40 days have not completed yet. And as the people started to repent, God had found it in his heart as he inspected the people uh, and what they did in repentance, uh, that he was happy enough to consider overturning his decision. And so Jonah hears of it or knows of it by way of prophecy. And it says here, and it displeased Jonah. Now, the English word displeased literally, um, literally means that he, he sees it to be evil. Now, this is the Hebrew word that Jonah saw this as evil and saw this as very great evil. So much so, and then he became very hot. And so the word angry. So let me explain this. Very great evil. Now, why would Jonah see this as very great evil? Remember, I had mentioned to you in the Hebrew, evil is always viewed 
or seen from the eyes of the beholder. When God saw that the people of Nineveh had repented of their evil, that what God saw was wrong that they did, and they turned around and reinstituted or repaid whatever they have uh, dishonestly gained from the people. So in the eyes of God, the things that the Nineveh people had done in repentance is good. And so he overturned his decision to overturn Nineveh. But in the eyes of Jonah, he saw this as great evil. That in the eyes of Jonah, it can't be. It's very wrong. Now, why was it very wrong? Now, in the coming verses, we will see this clearly. But let me just suggest to us that the reason why Jonah saw this as evil or great evil is not because uh, the people of Nineveh uh, shouldn't be receiving mercy from God. It is very much his concern about Israel which infers to us that for the longest time he was preaching to Israel for them to repent. Otherwise, God will punish them, and they didn't. And here he walked into the city of Nineveh that is far from Israel, doesn't know Jehovah God, and they repented. And in so doing, will reflect really badly on Jonah's people. They are supposed to repent and God will bless them. But in the end, they refuse. Now, the second thing here to note is this. When Jonah says in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And if nothing happened, Jonah would be thinking, well, I would sound like a false prophet. No, I said that something would happen and it didn't happen. But obviously, God had other ideas. Now in verse 2, it says, now when he's very angry, and then he spoke to God. So the idea here of pray, he looked at himself and says, why is all this happening? And so he entreated Jehovah, and then he said, so you can notice that this is a sequence of events. And he said this to God. He says, oh God, was this not what I had said when I was still in my country? And that would be in Israel. That you remember in chapter 1, when he was told to go to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish. So therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. He got a boat and he went way to the left instead of turning to the right. For I know, now this is important, that he recognizes God's character. Say, I know that you, God, are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. And this is something which I think all of us also need to be mindful of, the character of God. Jonah, as a prophet, is extremely clear of who God is. He is gracious. He can extend favor. He is merciful. It means that he is compassionate. When he sees people suffering, he will want to do something. He is slow to anger, and this means he has a long nose. Now, this is a Hebrew expression. If you have a short nose, the nose will get red very soon. When you've got a long nose, the nose takes a little longer to get angry. So this means he is long-suffering. It takes a longer time to get angry. Not that he doesn't get angry but it takes a longer time to get angry. He's abundant in chesed, in kindness, in showing kindness. Now, this is important because that's the character of God. 
And the last one is this. He who relents. Nacham. Again, I'm saying that this is not the word repent. It, it portrays God as being able to respond to a person or a nation's attitude in repentance. When the people repents from the warnings that he has given, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And Nineveh people actually repents and uh, reverts from doing the evil and repays those whom they have uh, done Hamas or injustice. And God will nacham from doing evil. This is what harm is evil. Doing evil towards them. And so Nineveh is not going to be overthrown. And that's why Jonah was very angry. In Jonah's eyes, that's that's bad because Israel won't repent. And so God will eventually destroy and remove them from the land. That is the reason why Jonah ran away. Do not want Nineveh to be an example to Israel that even a people who does not know God, that God is not with them, that God is only with Israel, God has given Israel the Torah. God has given Israel the temple. God has been with Israel. God has redeemed Israel from Egypt. And yet they do not repent. But a people far away who doesn't know God, being warned by the prophet of God, repents from exactly the same thing that Israelites are doing. And that would be a slap in the face to Israel. That is also why Jonah was very angry. And so in verse 3, he says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. I'd rather die, for it is better for me to die than to live. It is with that kind of a commitment to his people in Israel that Jonah felt so much for, that Jonah doesn't want them to, to go on a tangent away from God. And now looking at, Nineveh, of all people, uh, a, a people whom everyone knows is very violent, and yet they could repent when they are told to repent because God's going to destroy them. But Israel, day in, day out, Jonah would have been preaching to them. Many prophets have preached to them, and yet they don't. And so to Jonah as an Israelite, he says, it's better for me to die than to live. And listen to what God has to say. And then, so understand that after Jonah said these words, and then Yehovah said, is it right for you to be angry? Now, let me just maybe retranslate this to say, it's not about, is it right? It is, are you are you deeply grieved? That would be a, a, a better way. Or are you so deeply grieved? Now the word here is uh, are you are you being is this is this really right? to be angry? Is it really good for you to be hot? Right, that's, that's another way of putting it. So God is actually questioning Jonah. Why do you like that? Why do you feel so bad about this situation? Remember, the situation is God is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, will relent from doing evil when the people of Nineveh repents. Why are you so deeply grieved? Why do you think it is good for you to be angry like that? Why do you prefer to die than to live, seeing that God has nacham from his decision to destroy Nineveh? Now, from verse 5 onwards, 
we would see that God is going to give Jonah a, a life lesson. Remember, this is not at the end of the 40 days yet. So Jonah hears that God is not going to destroy and God is happy with what they're doing. And Jonah became very angry. And verse 5 is, and then Jonah went out of the city. That's the city of Nineveh. Remember, it's a three-day walk journey. He went out and he sat on the east side of the city. So if this was the city, so he sat here on a hill. Okay, this is the east. And this is the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Two things you need to pay attention. He made a shelter. The idea of a shelter is a sukkah. So understand that a sukkah is like a little hut. You may have heard of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Sukkot is a plural word for sukkah, a hut. And it's usually made of leaves. So allow me just to draw this. This would be, this is Jonah. Let's say that he's sitting there watching. And then what he did was he built a little hut, a little shelter. And with the shelter, he would have put leaves over it, right? Leaves and basically a very simple leaf hut. And then you have the sun, okay? And with the sun shining, it would be rather hot. And so, we are now seeing what is going to happen here. He is sitting here under the shade, but not very much of a shade. He is in the hot sunlight and he is not comfortable, but yet he wants to see what would become of the city of Nineveh that maybe, just maybe, the people of Nineveh would turn around and do more evil and ignore God or, uh, or insult God or blaspheme God. And then he could see what's going to happen that in 40 days, Nineveh will certainly be overthrown. Verse 6. And then, Jehovah God, then this word prepare is an important word. Because we have seen this word before, and we're going to see a few more times. This word is a point. We saw this in chapter uh, 2, or the end of chapter 1, that God appointed the, a big fish to swallow up Jonah. So we saw that as the first time. Now, this is the second time. Now, God is appointing a plant. Now, this plant, I will give you the Hebrew name. The Hebrew name is the Kikayon. So, instead of a plant, just call it Kikayon. We don't know exactly what plant, but in the Hebrew, it's called the Kikayon. So, we'll call it the Kikayon for now. And then God made it come over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery or discomfort. Now, what does that mean? It means this. So we have Jonah, again, he sits, right? He sits there. And in this case, it's no longer the hut. God made a tree or a kikayon tree or a plant and it grew so let me just show you it grew up it grew up and it has big leaves apparently 
So we have leaves. So let me just show you. We have leaves. And it shades. And this one gives um, Jonah a, a very good shade. So now we continue with the story. And then Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Uh, very grateful is, how should we say? Uh, very grateful is rejoices, right? He rejoiced. Wow, he was elated. This word misery is really evil. But we translate it as misery or discomfort because it's evil in the eyes of Jonah. It's just too hot. So that's evil. Now, we don't see that in the English, but at least I think by now you would have, you will get the idea. Anything that you see that is not right, that you are unhappy with, or it is hurtful to you, that's evil. And so Jonah's evil in this case is that it's too hot. The sun was just too, too great. And so this Kikayon had sheltered him, so it was good. But as morning dawned, as the sky turned bright in the morning, so when we're talking about overnight, the next day God prepared. Now this is... Again, the same word. And we need to be very mindful. This word, prepare, is the same as this, appoint. Now, we have now three times seeing this. God had appointed uh, the fish in chapter 1. In chapter 4, God is appointed the kikayon to grow over Jonah and to shelter Jonah. Suddenly, that's a miraculous plan. And then the third one is God appointed a worm. Now, this is interesting because the worm would hurt the plant and the plant withered and that there was no more shelter. Now, this was when the sky was starting to turn bright. And then verse 8. And then... As it happened, the sun came up like before. Now, God prepared another word, a point, right? So we have number four appointment. And God prepared a vehement east wind. In verse 8, when we talk about a vehement uh, east wind, we are really saying that this is a harsh east wind. Now, what is the, the, the difference between a wind and an east wind? Uh, back in 2019, in November, it was supposed to be a cold month or a cool month. And I was in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and in Tiberias. And for that period of time, they had the east wind for about a week to two weeks. And it was so hot that we all were wearing shorts. In fact, as the wind blew in the night, it would dry up your skin that it cracked. So a harsh east wind is a very hot and dry wind. And it's very uncomfortable. Very, very uncomfortable. And when your lips crack and your skin crack, uh, it becomes hurting because uh, it would peel so badly. The second thing that God did was he prepared the sun to beat on Jonah's head and that he grew faint. Now, this is important uh, to... to Remember, growing faint. The idea of growing faint literally means that um, he, he, he is actually feeling really weak, right? Feeling really weak. The sun is striking upon his head. And then uh, upon whatever he was trying to cover up, he couldn't. 
and this this idea here is he is in a very bad state. Now, this is a live example. God has intentionally sent to destroy the Kikayon literally overnight. And the sun came up to be so hot with the east wind at the same time. He was extra, extra hot. And it was so evil to Jonah that he wished death for himself. It is better for me to die than to live. It is that kind of a feeling. So understand, in the Hebrew words, it's very hard to describe a lot of emotions because it's all very action-oriented. And so the words that is being described by Jonah is the, the, the situation for him, he is feeling so uncomfortable to the point where you can't imagine that he'd rather die than to live. And so he was wishing that he would die. It is a lesson to show Jonah something that God wants to teach him because when God relented from his decision to destroy Nineveh, he became very angry. And then he said, it's better for me to die than to live. And so now he is saying the same thing, it's better for me to die than to live. But it's all because of a kikayon. The kikayon died. Verse 9, then would be and then. So as long as we understand what had happened in the previous passage, that God had appointed the, the kikayon to grow, and then God had appointed a worm to eat it up, and that God had appointed the east wind and the sun. Now, God asked Jonah, the question is this, is it right or is it good for you to be angry about the plant that you are hot about the kikayon? And look at what Jonah said. And Jonah said, and then Jonah said, I think that would be a better way to express it. First God asked, and then Jonah answered, it is good for me to be angry even to death. And so Jonah responded quite immediately. That was his natural response. Better let me die. Now I want to point out to you our last passage, verse 10 and 11, would be a focus. Verse 10, it says, and then God replied. It says, you have had pity on the plant which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in the night. Now, this word here is that you had pity. The idea of pity is uh, chus. You have compassion, right? You had compassion. On the kikayon, for which you have not labored, meaning you have not toiled. You did not plant it. You did not work on it. You did not watch it grow up. You did not see it strong. That's what this word is, become strong. And then it grew up in the middle of the night. And then in that night, it perished. And so the word perish is avad, it is lost, it is gone. Now that was the lesson, right? So God says, you know what? You are showing a lot of pity for something you didn't do. It was a plant that you didn't toil, you didn't plant, you didn't make it grow, you uh, and you didn't do anything, basically. You just sat there and it came out and then it died. Now, verse 11 is what I want us to pay attention. God's 
we taught to uh, Jonah is very crisp. And then, and this is have compassion. So observe what God said. Should I not have compassion over Nineveh, that huge city, three days walking, in which are more than 120,000 persons, more than 120,000 humans, right? The word person is Adam humans. who cannot discern between their left hand and their right hand. The idea of discern is no. Perceive. And this idea here is people who are innocent, uh, who doesn't know how to choose, do not know to choose good over evil. You know, this left hand, right hand thing is actually a very oriental expression. You know, on the right hand, on the left hand, uh, do not stray to the right or do not stray to the left. Uh, and, and the idea here is they, they can't choose. They are innocent. And by way of this expression, uh, we may be able to infer that they were all children. right? Or if they were adults, they were very naive. They, they can't tell. And there were a lot of animals. This is animal life. And so we have a lot of what we call innocent lives. 120,000. That's a lot of people that God sees as innocent. Uh, God never repeated that they had repented. And we are to assume that they did. And maybe not all 100% did, but it was enough for God to decide that, yes, I will overturn my decision. At the same time, God had also weighed that the city of Nineveh being so huge that they had a lot of innocent lives, that these are the same lives that God made in his image. They may not be Israelites. They may not know God in the same way the Israelites knew God, but they are also innocent. And so God says, should I not have the same pity? You pity the Kikayon you never did. Should I not pity Nineveh, which I made them in my image? That, that is the argument that God is putting forth to Jonah. A plant, Kikayon, that you didn't do a single thing, you can have pity. Nineveh, a city of so big, with so many people that they have repented by way of speculation and implication from chapter 3. But more importantly here, God is referring to them as innocent. That they don't know how to choose right from left. They can't tell between their left hand and their right hand. They are innocent lives, 120,000 that I had made. I mean, the, God made humans. God gave life to people. And God values those lives when they are innocent, especially when most of those who are doing evil have repented. Animals as well are innocent. And so God values life. And that's what I want to point out to you. God values life. And this would be innocent lives or repentant lives, right? Repentant lives. But no matter how we see this, we always understand God is the creator of life. 
And he values the life that he made for the man and the woman and the descendants. And Nineveh, the people there, are also descendants from what God has done. And God should pity them because God did work on them. And Jonah felt that he had a right to feel pity or compassion for the Kikaya he never made. And so the contrast is this. You, Jonah, did nothing. And yet you can have pity. Me, God, I made them all. And they are innocent. There are a lot of them, not just a handful, a lot of them. And God spared their lives. They're innocent. They have repented. Now, it's very different, I guess, from the time of Genesis chapter 19, for example, uh, 18 and 19, where, where uh, God went down to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy them. And, and Abraham said, well, if you had uh, 50 righteous now, Sodom and Gomorrah is a city that very much like Nineveh. Well, they couldn't find even five. All right. And so what I think as a conclusion for the book of Jonah is this. God is addressing a people who doesn't belong to him, at least from a standpoint of a nation. They are a violent nation from history. They have done a lot of Hamas, a lot of violence, a lot of injustice, a lot of hurtful things towards the people that cannot defend themselves. They are doing exactly the same thing that God is warning Israel. But the people of Nineveh repented. The people in Israel has not, not yet. And so this becomes a very important example to Israel. Up till today, the Jews in Israel will always read the book of Jonah as a reminder that even the non-Israelites can repent. And they will read the book of Jonah to remind themselves that they too must repent before God. And so this whole chapter is to remind us that God is a compassionate God. Uh, he has grace and favor. He is long-suffering, slow to anger. He is full of mercy, full of kindness, and he will relent uh, and change his decision when the nation turns from their evil. And that is a constant reminder to Israel. And I suppose Jonah as well. And Jonah will have to go back and do the same to the people of Israel after this. Uh, with this, I trust that we have gleaned a little bit more about who God is, how he works, how he thinks, what he wants, how he values, and what we should do. And may God bless the reading of his word as we have covered the four chapters of the book of Jonah. May God bless his reading.